What's great about RPGs is it's, it's really all about characters and story. It's interesting when you think about like what happened to Infinity Engine games because they were huge. I mean, we worked on a lot of them in the late 90s, even into the early 2000s. I never believed that the audience was getting tired of them. What happened was that publishers and distributors told us that people were tired of them. You know, our goal was never to recreate Baldur's Gate. Our goal was to create a game that felt as big and expansive and epic as Baldur's Gate did when you first played it. when you think about like what happened to Infinity Engine games because they were huge. I mean, we worked on a lot of them in the late 90s, even into the early 2000s. And then they sort of disappeared for a while. And I think the, and when I really think about it and I look at it, it's like we, the early 2000s was an interesting time for gaming. As someone who lived through that death of the isometric, you know, sort of uh, game, what happened was that publishers didn't want to make them anymore. So I never believed that the audience was getting tired of them. What happened was that Publishers and distributors told us that people were tired of them. I never really saw any financial basis for that. And so I think that, you know, it really, there was sort of this pent up, this pent up want and desire for those style of games. And, and the reason that they went away was just sort of a, I don't know, a, a market issue, market pressures and, and gamers moving to consoles. So everybody was talking about consoles. It was this huge resurgence or more just sort of every kind of, a lot of gamers moving towards consoles. And that was just about the time also when also games were kind of moving into, uh, into 3D and the Infinity Engine games kind of got caught in this middle between they were both 2D games and they were PC games. And so I think just they kind of fell by the wayside for a little while, but not for any reason that people didn't like them. I mean, people enjoyed them and, and you just see how they sold even in the, in the 2000s before Eternity came out. That type of game was almost abandoned for almost, uh, I want to say 12 years or so never iterated on again until we brought it back with Pillars of Eternity 1. I think that hit not only a younger generation of people that never really played Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, but the older gamers that really liked that type of experience. What's great about RPGs, it's, it's really all about characters and story. The richness of the writing and companions, depth and exploration that is somewhat harder to pull off in, in mo more modern games. 3D was the thing, and so publishers didn't want to make 2D games anymore, and distributors weren't interested in, in selling 2D games anymore. So that was this, this really perverse, self-fulfilling prophecy. And, you know, a lot of our fans that came over to Pillars, uh, the first game and also the sequel, these are people that, all the way back at Black Isle Studios, they were on our message boards. And so I knew that these fans were still around. I knew that they still wanted this type of game. So when we did the crowdfunding for Pillars, it, it kind of really changed the company fundamentally. You know, we went from a company that was working on um, IP, developing IP for other people, and working on licenses. And now we were actually going to be working on, our, we were going to working on our own IP. Pillars 1 definitely meant something to me because that was one of the first projects I was at, at a manager position on. Pillars 1, I think, was successful in part not just because it was a resurgence of, you know, the Infinity Engine style of game, but I think also because it brought a lot of new stuff to the table. You know, our goal was never to recreate Baldur's Gate. Our goal was to create a game that felt as big and expansive and epic as Baldur's Gate did when you first played it. The people who back the game and are hardcore fans that I don't want to disappoint them, and I do want to make sure, though, that people who are new to the genre feel welcome. They don't feel like, oh my god, I just can't take any of this stuff. And, and how that really changes how you have an outlook on everything is like, one, you are now a lot more responsible to people, particularly when you're crowdfunding it. 
Um, you're responsible for the people that have backed you and, and you need to come keep on talking to them. You need to make them feel part of the process. I mean, that was why it was, a, it was really big for me to try to continually make sure that we were updating people. I mean, I can't remember how many updates we did on Turnity One. I think it was 120, which is a little excessive, but, but, um, but I think that everybody really felt along for the ride. It all kind of meshed very well for us, but it was an interesting challenge early on trying to figure out what to do next and where to invest, because our budgets are only so big. Where do you get the best bang for the buck? And so with Pillars, our challenge was to create a world that was going to have um, some familiar fantasy touchstones, but also uh, innovate and create experiences and characters that were gonna be new for players. And so what Pillars 1 did, and what I think Pillars 2 does even more, is establish a really novel, fresh world with lots of very vibrant characters that, you know, the returning ones players will remember, but will be new and exciting. So I think the thing that people are going to really enjoy the most about Pillars of Eternity 2 is just how expansive it is. And, and I think that's the real difference between, from Eternity 1 to Eternity 2. Um, you have the world map, you have ships, you can go around all around the world. So it really feels almost more like this like completely full fantasy adventure versus something just more of a kind of going across the land from place to place. In Pillars 1, we had a pipeline down. We were able to make a very big game and people thought it looked pretty but there were things about the characters that they you know, thought could be improved a lot. And there were things in the environment that they said felt very static. And so the temptation at first was like, well, let's not, let's really not change too much because it's a little dangerous. Well, we almost rewrote everything for uh, graphically and redid most of the, I'd say 99% of the art was redone for Pillars 2. Early on in the process, we tried our best preparing the tools and preparing the pipeline. And uh, because of the complexity of the, art, the system we have built, a lot of that tool creation sort of seeped into the actual production. I think the biggest challenge was that we, it was, it was kind of just a risk to change anything. Making that decision is tough to begin with, because if you go down that road, you know that you have to redo pretty much everything on the art, art side. One week they're told to do, follow these rules, and then the next week rolls around. I was like, no, 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 actually we found some bugs in, in making things this way. Please do this, you know, instead. You have a, a end goal in mind of what it should look like, but getting to that point is, is not as easy as it sounds. It takes a lot of iteration, especially lighting, um, trying to get the lighting system down to, to make it work all correctly it takes a long time. Because of the way our pipeline works, we're rendering these all out as 2D images and which blows some people's minds because it looks like it's 3D, especially with the lighting. Just the amount of systems that we have from a game perspective, systemically, or just from a pipeline content creation system standpoint, there's so many micro systems in, inside the pipe that uh, maintaining all that in a sort of smallish team definitely was, uh, there was a lot of loose ends to wrangle, a lot of things to keep track of, yeah. We, ha we have two guys on the team that have such attention to detail and we kept on saying like, hey, is the art pipeline gonna be done yet? Is it gonna be done yet? And they were like, no, no, like we need to, it's not perfect yet. And they'd find stuff in the, the art pipeline that was incorrect. And they're like, we gotta redo everything. <laughs> Each step that we took, even though it was this kind of dangerous like process to go through, um, we were seeing so much of an improvement, especially in the, the ways that characters integrated into the environment, that it felt like, you know what, let's just keep going with this because on the team, when, when you have people on the team, and developers can get pretty jaded about the things that they're working on, but when you have the people on the team who are just you know, gushing about how an area looks and all the new changes that are going into it, it, it really encourages you to keep pushing forward, to keep pushing those boundaries. But one of the big things that we held off on for a really long time because we, we only want to do it once is paint overs. And there's you know, a pretty decent number of maps on the game that wound up getting paint overs by our uh, lead artist, Kazaruga. But areas that already looked really, really good went from really good to just incredible, just with uh, you know a few hours of paint over. It, it's a big challenge, and you have to be, have a lot of patience when going through that process. Um, but I think the end results have paid off. It was a, a very frightening sort of process, and there were times where I just honestly got really mad because <laughs> I'm like, we're doing what? Like we're changing the, the lighting pipeline again? Okay, cool. Well, can't wait to see what comes out the other end. And uh, you know, it turned out really well. So 
So we're about 24 hours from launch, and uh, as far as what's still on my plate, we, we are still patching the game as we speak, so there's plenty of bugs to hit. It's, it's just a rolling list. Hopefully not much. We're still working out some last minute issues, not necessarily on the game, but more like high level stuff, like making sure our Steam depots and our GOG depots are all set up with the correct languages and um, making sure our origin set up, making sure Apple, the uh, Mac store is all set up, making sure all the DLC content is working properly um, on all different platforms and stuff like that. So it's so some of the stuff that we're looking at right now. A lot of people think so much, so much of my day must just be absolutely focused on Pillars of Eternity. And, and a certain amount of day is focused on Pillars of Eternity. We've had a little hiccup with one of the versions and we're talking about it and we're trying to get the soundtrack out. A lot of stuff going on. There was something I had to work on this weekend, which is during the FIG campaign, Ferg suggested that I make a tabletop starter guide. And I was like, okay, but I'm gonna do whatever I want. And he was like, all right. <laughs> and I told everyone, I said, look, it's not really gonna be like D&D. It's gonna be like all these other games that I think are really neat, so buckle up. And I'd been working on it off and on, and it was supposed to be a 30-page starter guide, but it became a, I think, 63-page starter guide. <laughs> and um, it's kind of massive, and it kind of got out of control, and I'm like, okay, well, I'll get it into shape. And so I just, I had to kind of bust ass this weekend to wrap that all up and then send it over to marketing. So that, that should be all good. Should be, should be fine for tomorrow. So it's just a matter of getting through the queue. It's never quite done until, you know, the director or, you know, <laughs> the owners tell us to put down our pencils. So until that happens, we're, we're just gonna polish away. I've recently been moved on to another project, so now I'm getting into that world and that style, but still very eagerly watching uh, how Pillars releases and uh, all, the, all the streamers and the fans as they're discovering content there. So Journey 2 is going live tomorrow, and unless we unclick the button, uh, it will just go out there automatically. So many times in my career, I've had teams come into my office and say, we need a delay, you know? And so we, we as game makers, we want to always get as much in the game as we can. We want it to be bigger, we want it to be better. We want it to be polished, we want as few bugs in it, we want all these sorts of things. So the discussion to delay the game was really a group meeting between all the team leadership and the studio leadership and the company founders and everything else. And us just looking at basically our reports to say, how are we doing on bug fixing and when do we think we're going to be done? And when we looked at all those numbers and we, we looked at how we were doing on different departments, we said, in order to get everything done, we're gonna need to come out a few weeks later. So we did delay the game for, I think the original release date was early April and we delayed it to early Mar uh, May, I guess May right now. The main reason why it was delayed is just because it was buggy. There was also some audio that we were trying to implement that was a little bit behind, but the main thing was that we looked at the game and it's so big, it's bigger than we expected it to be. And we looked at it and we're like, there's so much good stuff in here, but there are so many bugs getting in the way of appreciating it. Obsidian had a reputation for making buggy games. Pillars 1 was in a pretty decent shape, and I was like, no, 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 like, look, for Deadfire, we really have to make sure that this comes out and it's solid, and obviously, with a game this big, there are always gonna be some bugs, but the important thing is they can't be bugs that really get in the way of the experience. They can't be bugs that break quests or really cause major issues. So we just said, look, it, April is not gonna happen. We have to give it another you know, few weeks. We just had a lot of features coming online fairly late in the process. Uh, one of the things that we decided to do is full VO. So every character is fully voiced in the game. And it was a lot of debate as to whether or not it would be you know, the, the very end of April or early May or, or something else. It, it came down to whatever the team felt like it could best accomplish um, all the bug fixing in as soon as possible. Delaying the Pillars launch to May was a really good thing for our team. It gave us extra time to polish content, to fix bugs, and in that month, uh, we've, we've made a lot of progress and a lot of improvements that I think are gonna make the game much, much better for players on release. We realized, hey, in order to come out with a game that we're really proud of and that we want to say, this is our best possible put, put forward, we wanted to spend a few more weeks making the game more stable, less buggy, stuff like that, and just addressing anything we could. 
One thing that we've tried to do uh, more recently is, is making sure that our bug numbers are actually fairly low. The delay really made the game just more polished is, is what it comes down to. You know, it's there's a thousand little details to point out of, oh, this feature works a little bit differently, or actually we added some UI notification here, or we added some videos here that were previously still images. Playing the game today versus playing the game two months ago, it's amazing how many little differences that you're like, oh yeah, I forgot that this, this was different before. And um, it just makes the game feel better. In a month delay is a lot easier to swallow too than a four month delay. Same thing with Pillars 1, I think everyone was on board with delaying it. I think our launch window is a little bit better too. You know, and as the guy running the company, a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm really weighing. Um, I'm weighing sort of like we could spend infinite time and infinite money. What is, what's the right amount of money? What's the right amount of time? And it's super hard. And, and, and in the end, what we do is we, like a lot of times, we're looking at our bug burn downs. We're looking at what tasks are really remaining to do. And we're trying to just gauge this amount of time where that is the appropriate, but what's the right amount of time to spend on this. And sometimes money is involved. That's, that's true, you know, from like, you can't run out of money because then the game will never come out. So we are balancing all that stuff. And as, as games get bigger, I mean, and, and we're, we are always looking at the budgets and we're seeing where we can get to. And, and sometimes months in advance, we kind of have to make decisions about like, we may need some more money. And if we need some more money, where are we going to get it? You know, and, um, or can we do it without the money? And that's, and so we're also kind of looking, we're looking at graphs, we're looking at the bank account, we're looking at just figuring out what, what is the best thing to do, knowing that we would love to work on it infinitely, but it has to come to an end at some point. So work-life balance is important at Obsidian, and the company, I think, has a really good culture, um, a really positive culture that encourages people to, you know, lead lives outside of work, uh, spend time with their families. In my off time uh, at the company, we have a uh, softball team uh, that is a, you know, all employee-based, uh, and I really enjoy that. We play that every week. Uh, we play at a local, local league in the city, and, uh, you know, we're terrible, but we all have fun. <laughs> Our, our owners have been, you know, in the development business for years, and so, you know, they understand what the experience is like for us. Um, and I think they, you know, want us to be able to stay around for a long time, and they understand our value as, uh, you know, people who are going to be part of this company for years, and not just as people who you, you know, bring on for one game and then, you know, move along. I mean, one of the things that I'm really into is bicycling. I really enjoy cycling. I enjoy restoring vintage bicycles. When I'm just getting real stressed out, I go out to my garage and I have a bunch of old bike frames uh, that are in various states of repair. <laughs> There's always something where I can go out to the garage and look around and I'm like, oh yeah, I was supposed to fix that up. So that's that's my sort of outlet is, is that sort of stuff. So I have a bunch of systems I use to basically make sure I'm working on the most important stuff. Um, and it's made me uh, make sure that my days are somewhat sane and somewhat normal so that I can go home to my beautiful wife and horde of animals that we have in our apartment. So, Yeah, I do think that a lot of people, I don't think it's just video game developers, but I think I see a lot of people that because so much of uh, this modern life is, is really about working in offices and things like that, I think people really find a lot of uh, enjoyment in doing things uh, that are either with their hands or outdoors. And bikes are great because I can do both. I can, I can stay in my garage and I can kind of wrench on stuff and listen to music and, uh, you know, get stressed about a different type of thing. <laughs> and then when I'm done and I'm satisfied, I can get on my bike and I can ride around. It's Southern California, so it's almost always good riding weather. Production team, your producers, your leads, I've always found that they're very good about, you know, encouraging people to take their time off when they need it about encouraging people to work normal hours um, outside of crunch, and about trying to minimize crunch as much as possible. So that's all been very good. There was this running issue with um, Docs and Pillars 1, where they were supposed to be in the game, and we had like all these problems with ducks, and people kept trying to put them in, and they were like, no, 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 they're cut. And they're like, no, I think we can do them. I think we can get ducks in. And then people would be like, yeah, and they'd like put the ducks back in. <clears throat> and then somehow at the beginning, of this project, we were talking about doing ducks again, and then Lindsay Laney came in and uh, drew that there, and it stayed there just throughout the whole development cycle. So.
Whenever we come out with a new game, it's it's sort of like um, it's like you're presenting your child or your baby to to see if people like them. And I think one of the things that I'm always doing as as a CEO and owner of a company is like I'm just I'm really just hoping that my ba people will love my baby. Let's see, so when one of our games finally comes out, uh, it whether it's a formal or an informal tradition, we oftentimes end up reading reviews together, sort of passing our favorite bits back and forth, and just sort of discovering how our community is now discovering our game. I do try to take feedback very objectively. I've been doing this 19 years, so at this point I don't really take things personal unless people try to make it personal. And thankfully, most people don't. They mostly just say like, this sucks, I hate this. Which is about the game. It's not like they're saying like, you Josh Sawyer, you, I'm coming to kill you. <laughs> like no, no one's really saying that. I don't take it personally. Sometimes I feel bad because I'm like, Oh, like there were a few bugs that people saw where I was like, oh, I can't believe we didn't catch that. And whether the person who was streaming or the audience was like really annoyed by it or like kind of okay with it, I really just try to watch these things to say like, you know, what can, what is their time to still fix before anyone else sees it? And it's really about just the learning experience. Um, it's so good to see people playing something in an environment where they just kind of say what's on their mind. Like the people in the chat don't really care if I'm there. They probably don't even know that I'm sitting there watching them. So getting that feedback, seeing what people are saying on forums, I, uh, I, take, it, I take it pretty much as it's meant, which is, you know, this is how I, I felt about the game. And there's nothing wrong with how you feel about something. It's, it's really up to me to figure out how can we take their feedback and try to improve the game. I, I do read a lot of the reviews of the game, um, taking all that into account, making um, notes on like streamers, like watching streamers play the game. Um, you get to see a lot of things that you probably, like just watching people play your game, you see a lot of things that you've never seen before, like what people struggle with, what user interfaces people might uh, look at and might not understand. It's nice when streamers ask themselves questions or if they get stuck on something or they don't understand something, like taking notes on that. It's not just, for future patchwork on Pillars 2, but it's just for future work at Obsidian, so just having that knowledge and um, making our games better. So on Pillars 1, uh, there was an inside joke about doing a Metacritic uh, uh, kind of challenge. So if we meted over an 85 on Pillars 1, um, one thing I tweeted out um, shortly before the game came out is if we met it over 85, I would go to Arby's and eat a, uh, a famous meat mountain. And that's a, a $10 sandwich from Arby's, um, which has all different types of meats in it, and it's, it's very delicious. <laughs> so um, we actually uh, meted uh, way over that. I think it was at 90. Um, when I when I took this challenge, um, so the, some of the team members went to Arby's um, about a month after the game came out, and I took the challenge and I ate the meat mountain all in one sitting, um, and it was delicious. And it was um, a lot easier to eat than I thought it was going to be. But uh, I have the receipt here. Um, it says it's from April uh, 2015. Here's the receipt. It has my name on it too, which is pretty cool. Um, and cheers. Arby's, call me, we'll do lunch. <laughs>when we did the crowdfunding for Pillars, it, it kind of really changed the company fundamentally. And I think as a studio, what it meant is it just, it meant that we had something ourselves that we could keep on building on. And, and that was something different. You know, every, time, every other game that we've ever made, there's always been a question like, okay, we get to make this game, are we gonna get to make the sequel? With Eternity though, I mean, this really is the time, like we could start planning for sequels and sequels of sequels you know, before we even finished because it was our decision and, and not someone else's. And it's interesting because I, I go all the way back to Baldur's Gate uh, and I just remember me and Chris Parker were talking and, and we had this like, we're just, we just didn't know, like we didn't know how well it was gonna do or not do. And we, we, we thought, we were like, okay, if it could only sell, I, I forgot the number, but I think we're like 250,000 units. We're like, if we can sell 250,000 units, I mean, I mean, that's like the moon. And, and it was so funny that after launch, of course, it's Baldur's Gate has done incredibly better than that. And so I, I don't know, a lot of it is, is just that it, I think the first thing that we're doing is we're, we're, not, we're not unsure because we know we've done an amazing amount of work, but you're always wondering if people are going to love your baby. 
I'm hoping players will enjoy the freedom that we give them to explore the story and to explore the Deadfire archipelago at their own pace. Um, we worked really hard to create a very reactive story. We try to, to guide the player along, but also to give them lots of room to move at their own pace and to find the adventures that interest them. Um, I feel like it's a brand new coat of paint over the experience. Programmers, our artists, our environment artists, our visual effects artists have done an incredible job. They've made the world feel much more dynamic. The day-night cycles add a lot. The dynamic foliage adds a lot. The lighting is just incredible in the game, and that's one of the first things that people notice, so. The richness of the writing and companions, depth and exploration that is somewhat harder to pull off in, in mo more modern games. Whether I have a single most favorite uh, piece in the game or not, I, I really liked how Ukaizo, the tile set of Ukaizo, how that came together. And um, I don't know if this is a bit spoilery, but it's one of the last areas of the game. And uh, Sean Dunning did a bang up job doing the, uh, the area art for that. Those pieces look great. I've really enjoyed um, just the new tone and the flavor of Dead Fire. Pillars 2 is, it's a really big game. And I think there's a lot more humor there's a little more of a lighthearted charm. Uh, we cover still some very weighty topics, but we try to give the player a breadth of experiences and you know a lot of fun, lighthearted, uh, you know, just easygoing moments to balance out uh, some of the very heavy things that they're also addressing. I think that the team really put so much love and effort into this. It's a uh... It was kind of exhausting at times, and like I said before, like I've been I've been directing games uh, more or less nonstop for the past eight or nine years, and so I'm going to take a little bit of a break <laughs> for the next year or two. So it's it is really nice to uh, go out for a while on something that seems that uh, fans are really going to like. It's really just taking the first game and making it better in every possible way we can. So when a game goes live, I mean, it's a huge thing. I mean, a team has been spending, you know, two years, three years, four years, sometimes five years, um, putting all of this time and energy into it. And so, and it's kind of a momentous thing, you know, and we try, we try to memorialize it with certain things, you know. Um, uh, you know, we, we often will do patches for the team, you know, that's sort of like a specific patch for it. We'll, we'll do a champagne toast. We're doing that with the Eternity 2 team tomorrow. Um, we are, um, we'll do a, a launch party. Uh, so we try to really recognize it for everybody. You know, we, we, we give people days off. Like, like we really try to acknowledge that, that everybody really went through this thing and it was hard, um, but it's ended up into something that's pretty cool and, um, and they needed to, and they, and they were, should be really proud of themselves. How do you feel right now? Huh? How do you feel right I now? I feel good. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> reviews are coming in. Uh, the game's doing good. Uh, we fixed a problem on Steam, <laughs> which is always which is always good. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we'll just we'll, we'll see what people say now because I think that's what's, what's cool about games nowadays is that you get to uh, you hear what everybody says and then you get to you get to work on you basically go oh hey this works this doesn't work and then we just get to make the game better and better. So the launch was this morning. Uh, I woke up. I, I admit it was a little bit it was a little bit like Christmas. I couldn't sleep very well, so I was up. And there was an earthquake this morning at like five in the morning, um, so that woke me up too. But I wasn't able to sleep. I kept on checking my phone to see if anyone broke an embargo for reviews. So I woke up today, which is Pillars Two launch day. I woke up about actually I woke up at five o'clock because there was an earthquake, and so the earthquake woke me up. And then I was kind of drifting back to sleep. And then my daughter came in and was like, "There was an earthquake." I go, "Yes." <laughs> and I go, and I go, she go back to sleep now. She's like, oh, okay. And, uh, and so then I was sort of awake and everything. So I started kind of looking at Steam charts and it was pretty amazing to see that even though we were still in pre-order, we're not out. Like we were, we were at like the top of the US charts. Got into work a little bit early and then checked in with everyone just to make sure everything was running smoothly. And then that, that was pretty much it. Once everything was green lit, our producer in charge of managing the builds and everything gave the thumbs up and he said everything was going okay. Pretty much business as usual then at that point. Uh, you, wanna, you wanna find out how the game does. Uh, I got up, I came in, I got here about uh, 9.15, 9.30 and just started seeing if maybe anybody broke the embargo on reviews because who knows what's going on. And then we had a, a team meeting this morning. Josh uh, introduced uh, just the, the launch of the game um, to the team and congratulated the team. And we did a toast with champagne, which was really awesome. 
So whenever a game comes out at Obsidian now, we do, we do a champagne toast. And we just, you know, it's like a, it's a, to kind of thank everybody and make it a group moment and, and just sort of say, hey, we did it. And I think that's so important with games because you work on something for two years, three years, four years, some cases even longer. And I think it's just, it's just awesome to be able to get together and say, we did something. You know, we did something together and we made something great. And I have to c totally commend Josh. Um, you know, he got up in front of the team and, and, um, and he, you know, he's, he, he, he thanked everybody awesomely. And then just kind of waited until, until 10 o'clock for it to go live. And then uh, emails have been kind of going out all morning uh, as the number of Steam users increases or the amount of Steam traffic increases and, and what's happening on all the other sites and just kind of watching things roll in. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty exciting day for us. Um, a little bit stressed still, like it's not, I'm, it's, I'm still like a little nervous, like kind of anxious still. Um, we still haven't gotten a lot of reviews in. Um, I think we're at like 22 reviews right now. Um, we keep track of like whenever something, uh, something new pops up on Metacritic, like everyone sends it to the team. We've gotten a few semi bad bugs that we've discovered um, that we're trying to firefight right now. So that's another thing that's, a little bit stressful like seeing it's always disappointing when something like that happens but it's it's gonna happen um, but like trying to resolve those as, as soon as possible that's our number one priority right now and that we were we were just second in global charts to uh, to PUBG and so a lot of that and then I was kind of just checking like the seeing if any um, basically any reviews have been posted yet and just see if there's any other kind of talking about it and you know of course checking email to see if there was some last minute disaster um, you know it's I think it's so it's kind of like it's pretty complicated shipping a game it seems like something that might be simple where you just like press a button and a game comes out but there's just there's so many pieces and parts and little pieces of DLC in different languages and different you know, different distributors we work with and all this kind of stuff and it, it is and that is like the other thing you're always waiting for something to like that one little thing to know but yeah I guess that's what it is just checking where we're in steam dealing with the earthquake and seeing if anything had exploded there's definitely some bugs and issues in the game um, which is not unexpected like the game is so big and it's so hard to test something this ginormous the ones I'm worried about are like game corruption bugs where like you're your game is just completely corrupted and you can't progress after playing the game for 20 hours. And so far, at least, we haven't seen anything like that. A lot of the bugs are fairly cosmetic and minor and, and easy to fix. So I'm, I'm fairly confident right now that we don't have anything like super scary coming, coming down the pipe in the next few days, but I'm much happier this time around. With the success of Eternity 1 and now Eternity 2, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think a lot about whether you know, are, are we a different studio than we were 10 years ago? Absolutely, you know, when we were just, when we were first starting out, we were just a straight work for hire studio. Are we not, are, are we, are we not a work for hire studio? No, I mean, I, I don't, we are, we are, we are and we're not at the same time. Um, the other game we're working on is a work for hire um, game. I, on, it's, a, it's a work for hire game, but we also own the IP. So it's kind of a weird, it's a weird mix. But I, I, I never want to say we're not a work for hire studio because like that would say I wouldn't, I would turn down. I would have turned down the South Park game. You know, um, if you know, if Disney ever wanted to do a Star Wars game, do I just turn that down because, you know, because it would be work for hire. You know, so I guess I look at it that way. I mean, I, I, what's awesome about being an independent studio is we get to work on any brand that shows up or any IP that we want to make or anything like that. And I think saying that we're not work for hire it closes some doors that I that that don't need to be closed. I found my spine on the dead fire lines. To be way, hey, hooray, ya! From a dear wood babe to a sailor fine, hoorah for the dead fire lines! Now, dead fire roots, they make good time. To me way, hey, hooray, ya! With the clear white streets and inlets fine, hoorah for the dead fire lines! Oh, they're the lines where you can shine. Tell me way, hey, who oh, ya? Yeah. Oh, they're the lines where I spent me prime. Hurrah for the dead fire lines. 
does take a trick to put Marjorie. Tell me when, hey, who row ya? It's better to be drowned than hunt. Hurrah for the dead fire!